Before we just dive, you know, headfirst into the pool of cultural analysis in cultural in critical media studies, I want to take a step back and look at what do we mean by culture and ideology and lay that foundation for uh, the elements that we're going to be using in cultural analysis. So let's do just that. Starting with culture, what is culture? Culture is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So two important distinctions here. Um, first of all, culture is learned and shared. It's not genetic. It's not, um, you know, physiologically handed down genetically um, from from one generation to the next or you know, from one person to the next. It's it's something that we learn and we share. Okay. So and what do we learn and share? We learn and share these different symbols, language, values and norms. Um, those are the elements that consist of uh, or that make up culture. Culture consists of those four elements. Every culture will have symbols, language, values, and norms that are associated with it and then, uh, that are important in defining that culture. And again, that's what we use to separate one group of people from another. So that's what we mean by culture. Uh, some of the unique characteristics of culture that we need to be aware of. First of all, culture is collective. It is something that is shared, as we mentioned, between uh, a group of people, um, whether that's five people, whether it's five million people, um, that is less significant than that it is co collective. It requires people to buy into these things. In other words, a group of people to buy into and accept and associate with these symbols, language, values, and norms that, that make up this culture. So culture is collective. It is rhetorical. It is based in symbols, largely based in symbols. And that's an important element of that. So that makes it rhetorical that these the, the symbols have meaning um, and that they, they're specific to that particular group and uh, and may you know, be more or less meaningful or valuable to that group. But, but it's going to be rhetorical. It's all based on these symbols and for that particular group. It is historical. Culture is bound to a specific kind of time and place in history. Culture will evolve and culture remains in culture, but it, but it's not the same. The culture that you have when, you know, in the, in the 1980s, for example, the culture was very different than it is today. If we look at the symbols, language, values, and norms, we use different, uh, different language, you know, like gag me with the spoon and grody and things like that. Um, in the, in the eighties that we don't use today. Um, so there's different language that we use and there's different symbols, things that are important ways that we dress so a language, a culture is historical as well, and that it's bound to that specific you know, time and place in history. Uh, it's also ideological. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to take a specific look at at ideology um, next. So that's, but it's an important element of culture as well. So let's just dig into that. What is ideology? Ideology is a system of ideas that unconsciously shapes and constrains both our beliefs and our values. So this happens at a subconscious level. It happens below the level of consciousness that we develop um, this ideology, these ideologies. And it's just a system of ideas that develops that, that constrains our beliefs and our behaviors and structures those things. So um, what are then the structuring functions of ideology? What does it do for us in terms of structure? Uh, again, this could be positive or negative, but but it has these structuring functions. First of all, it has the uh, structure of limitation. One of the structuring functions of ideology is that it limits our 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 perceptions, our belief systems, our behaviors. Um, so if we look at the example of marriage, right, marriage. Um, and so what is marriage based on? Well, in the United States, we would say that marriage is grounded in uh, love, right? That's that's what you know, marriage consists of two people who fall in love and then they decide to, to make that official, so to speak, and, and really, um, uh, you know, to use modern terminology, make it official and, uh, and get married. And that's, you know, our, our Western understanding of love is limited by that perception, that ideology that, uh, that marriage is, is in fact based on love. Whereas in other societies, we see things like arranged marriages, people being placed in marriages. Maybe they've never met this other person. Uh, maybe they, yeah, but, but love really isn't a factor in this. And as Americans, we just think, what? That's nuts. The whole thing of marriage is love, right? Well, yeah, for our ideology and our culture, that's true, but that's not the only view of marriage and the only purpose of marriage. In fact, that's a fairly recent um, use of marriage or, or, or foundation for marriage. Um, in fact, arranged marriages or marriages based on different things other than love have existed for 
long, long time, and they make a lot of sense in many ways, depending on that culture and depending on uh, the values that they have and that they place in those things. So there's a lot to be said for, you know, the the, the uh, arranged marriages at, at times, but it's hard for under, us to understand because of that ideology that we have of marriage is very limiting. It's limiting in in regards to if the, if the two people aren't in love, then then they shouldn't be getting married, right? So. Um, we have that limiting ideology. That's an example, though, of how ideology limits our, our perception and our understanding of, of what's right and wrong and good and bad and what should be happening. We also see a sense of normalization. Ideology creates normalization for us. Right? So for, for much of the world, for example, it is what the norm is uh, the metric unit of measurement. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense. Everything is based in tens and the names are all based in tens and the, the different, you know, so when you get different, uh, you get 10 of something or, or less of something, then it's, it changes the name of it. Right. So, um, but, uh, but we can uh, look at that in metric system and, and it just is so bizarre to us, but for most of the world, that's what they use. That's what the norm is. But we use the standard measurement unit, right? which makes no sense, to be honest. This is the standard measurement uh, in standard units of measurement. They don't make any sense. They don't they don't really correlate to anything. You know, there's, uh, you know, how many, how, how long is a yard? Well, it's three feet. Well, how big is a foot? Well, a foot is 12 inches, 12 inches. What, you know, how, do, where does this come from? So 12 into one into, into three then. So a yard is, I got to first convert. Okay. Three feet. So 36 inches is one yard. What in the world? If we just had the metric system, we can just do this based on tens and everything is based on tens. And it's, it's somebody, for me, somebody who's like mildly OCD, that makes a lot more sense. Um, to, to, that's very satisfying to have everything in the even number, like just a nice round 10 there, right? Um, but we do the same thing, tablespoons and cups and everything. Nothing, nothing makes sense. It's all just kind of, grown, but it's what's normal for us. I mean, to try and switch to the metric system now would be uh, really, really difficult. That's why it hasn't happened, uh, because this is what we're used to. This is what's normal here. So we see it as the the, the right way. Our, our ideology is limited by based or based on what is normal for us. Uh, we, which side of the road should we be driving on? Well, obviously we should be driving on the right side of the road. Other places do it on the left, but that's not the norm here. And our ideology is based on the norm. So we look and find comfort in that norm, in that in that, that range of the norm in the middle there, that the nice juicy middle uh, where most people live in that norm. That's how our ideology then is shaped and everything outside of that norm then is hard to imagine because it's outside of our personal ideology, our cultural ideology. Another function of, of ideology is this sense of privileging. Ideology establishes privileging and, uh, and is, is responsible for privileging. And then that just kind of pervades every aspect of our thinking and our approach to things. So, um, for example, privilege right now, as, we, as we've been discussing a lot in our culture, rests and has for a long time rested in uh, white heterosexual males. Right? That's the, the privilege. We, you know, if you're white heterosexual male, then you have um, just kind of built in privileges that other people don't have. I mean, you have this, these advantages that, uh, that other people don't have just by virtue of those things that you can't really control. Right. But, but they bring that, that privilege. So, I mean, white heterosexual men have an advantage in a, in a lot of ways. We see that in our culture. Um, another way we see it is in, um, the, you know, the role of technology in our culture is becoming more and more pronounced. Uh, it, we know that technology is such an important part of our personal lives. It's an important part of our professional lives. And it just is, uh, people who can use and understand and, and are good with technology have this significant advantage. So if you are in a school that really emphasizes technology and you have that opportunity, which means you're in an area that can afford that in their schools and make that a priority in their schools, um, then you have a significant uh, advantage over students who are not going to have access to that kind of technology. So when they enter the workforce, when they come up against this technology, it's going to look very foreign to them and not be as comfortable to them. It's what we call the digital divide, right? That, 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 you know, people who have access to this and become comfortable with it have an advantage over people who do not. So there's this type of privileging that is happening as well. If you're, if you're in a situation, a privileged situation where you have access to this technology that, um, affects your, your ideology and the way that you use it and the opportunities that you have. Then we have interpolation, right? Interpolation is another structuring function of ideology. 
um, we see this through interpretation and, and just the way that we view different things. So uh, interpolation of, of the Bible, for example, and what it represents and the, the, the way that it's read and the way that we use um, and, and frankly, in some ways, pick and choose aspects of the Bible to, to highlight and to use and to, to make our case for those things. We do the same thing um, with the flag in the United States. We, we uh, you know, put different meanings into it, you know, and then the way that we uh, identify and and look at uh, the look at different different types of leadership and leaders around the world um, that we that we um, assign you know, value to these things. And I, again, I'm not disagreeing with these, but you know, who's good, who's bad, but it just depends on your perspective, right? So we see these these people as it's bad our interpretation or interpolation of that says that. So at this point, you may be saying to yourself, Professor Rocky, obviously this is fascinating information and, and good for us to know, and it's really critical stuff, right? I mean, I get that. But what's the point? Where's all this going? Why is this significant to our examination of of uh, uh, cultural media studies and, and cultural analysis that we're going to look at uh, momentarily? Um, well, this is a lot like an iceberg, right? We see what's at the top. We, it's beautiful. It's huge. We know it's dangerous. We know it's there, but it's it's gorgeous. But we also know that 75 to 80 percent of that iceberg is down below, and that's the really huge part. Okay, and that, and so we're just seeing the the very part top part that's exposed above the water. The same is true for us and for others um, in terms of you know we have our observable behaviors and practices, the things that people hear us say and see us do, and that we the, the way that we live our lives out loud and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the truth is, most of what we are and what makes us tick and makes us who we are is beneath the surface. It's made up of our culture and ideology. And those are things that people can't see and don't necessarily won't know about us, won't ever really be visible to them in a, in the traditional sense. They're going to see those observable behaviors and practices that stem from that culture and ideology. But most of the actual culture and ideology is beneath the surface. We need to understand that about ourselves about other people and about the artifacts and, and things that we experience in the world as well. If you have questions about any of this, about culture and ideology or you know, how it relates to um, critical media studies, as we're going to take a look at cultural analysis, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that this provides an adequate foundation for our discussion of cultural analysis as we use this information then to dive deeper into that critical framework and, and lens of critical media studies.